Where do you think property prices are going in 2024? Where do you think we'll end the year? I think they're going absolutely... So what to expect from the property market in 2024? What are the challenges and more importantly, what are the opportunities for you guys to profit from the wonderful world of property? Well, to explore that sub subject, I'm joined by my very special guest and good friend, John Howard. Hi, John. Am I a friend of yours? You are a friend. Is yes. that official? You are very, very I'm high up on the list. absolutely delighted. I've got three now. <laughs> but, but John, you are a property mogul, aren't you? How many... <laughs> How many thousands of property deals have you done uh, in your career? Over 4,000 deals. Over 4,000 4, 4, 4, deals. Yeah. And, um, of course, you, know, it, you um, have, uh, it, well, you owned a very successful auction franchise, estate agency as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, and you've built uh, houses from the, uh, sorry, uh, new build blocks of flats from the ground up. Yeah. Um, the Homes for in England scheme was one of the biggest, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, we borrowed 20 million from, from them to, to build 150, or to finish 150 flats. So I do a lot of part finished, where we buy you know, uh, developments that are part finished, people got into difficulty, a lot of them at the moment, of course. So uh, in terms of um, predictions, I've been predicting the property market, this is my 44th year of predictions. Wow. I haven't got them all right, mind you. But we'll give it a go. Well, I'm sure you've got a great track <laughs> record because you, you, you know why I know you've got a great track record because you're still here. Yeah, I'm still you know, I'm To I'm still here. be here in the world of property, which always goes through cycles. And, you know, it's like musical chairs. When the music stops, what do you do? Yeah. You know, and the music has stopped at various times in our careers and we're still here. Absolutely. You know, I've survived three serious property recessions. I don't really think this one is one, to be fair. Um, but certainly three others have been. And we've got a lot to cover in this. And of course, um, we are um, uh, fellow angels on the hit Sky TV show Property Elevator. Yes, I'm never quite sure whether that name's right, Angel. But um, you Devil, know, do you think? Th no, well... I think we should be Property Devils. You said that I didn't, but actually it's not... That isn't actually a bad title for a show, you know that? Well, what, the Property Devils? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> property Daredevils, I should think. Daredevils is probably even better, yes. But that's been a uh, thrilling ride. And a lot of people uh, ask me, um, uh, do you and John get on? Do you know what? They ask me, I always say, no, we don't. <laughs> oh, you, oh, you started that rumour. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering who started that rumour. Anyway, let's just crack on with yes. some of these, uh, some yeah, of these predictions. Absolutely. Um, John... Tell me, I mean, I've been listening to you for a few years now and you've been talking about um, choppy waters and prices are going to go down for yeah. some time. Um, but you know, last month, uh, property prices uh, nudged up a little bit. Well, if you say it for long enough, you're always going to be right at some point. <laughs> and if you're buying a lot of property, you want to make sure that the market's depressed as possible. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, it has been, it's been coming. You, you know, we knew that interest rates were, were too low for too long. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing lasts forever and it shouldn't have lasted anywhere near the length it did in my view and I'm sure other people's and yours as well, I think included probably. So we knew this was coming and the market and, and property is all about, you know, learning from your past mistakes, learning from past history and property is, you know, every 15 to 20 years, there's a problem in property. There's a problem. So, and this is a problem, and people are in trouble. Okay, the market hasn't dropped more than 10%, probably, unless, of course, you've made a big mistake in developing property. Because in the last three years, how do you survive a 30% increase in, mm -hmm. in bill costs, a doubling of interest rates, and a property market that's gone down 10, 15%. Now, it's a micro market, and you might say in certain areas it hasn't gone down at all. In other areas, it's gone down a lot. Let me ask you a question. Where was the, most, where was the poorest performing city or town in the UK last year? Poor. And how much did it go down? I don't know. Go on. Stoke, 24%. What was the best? I don't know. <laughs> Huddersfield, up 22%. That just shows the spectrum. Exactly. That just shows the spectrum. Spot on. Absolutely. But the other thing uh, to think about is that with the areas that have gone down, yep. the situation is probably worse yep. than that because what we are talking about is prices. We're not Absolutely. looking at inflation-adjusted prices. No. And even Huddersfield has probably gone down when you inflationary adjust. adjust. 
Well, inflation has been a big, big problem. Of course, under a Labour government, there's normally more inflation. And, and actually, most property uh, investors have done quite well under a Labour government in the past. I'm not sure we'll, it will be this time. I know that's a subject probably for another show. We'll cover that in a, yeah. in a little bit. But, you know, it, there's different aspects of doing well, I guess. Yes. But we'll cover all that in a little bit. But where do you think property prices are going in 2024? Where do you think we'll end the year? I think they're going absolutely Nowhere. <laughs> a flatlining. A flatlining. I mean, you've had predictions of minus 5%. Some of those people now say, oh, it's plus 3 or 4%. Mm. I think they're going to roughly stay the same where they so, are. So predicting that, um, what are you going to do um, to capitalise on that flatlining? Well, certainly I'm not anticipating any price increases. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people uh, this year, I think... The optimistic ones may be saying, oh, the market's going to go up 10%. I'm going to build that into my deal. You know, I can afford to pay 5%, 10% more for the property. That's crazy. I look at what it is now and I reduce my price based on the fact that the market might drop 10%. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm building uh, safety into every deal I do. Now, you can argue, well, that's okay for you, John. You've got better contacts than some other people and you're buying distressed stock, mm -hmm. which, of course, not everyone can do. I understand all those things. But it's very easy to kid yourself that things are going to be better, everything's going to be rosy, you know, and it isn't. Mm -hmm. It isn't. It's still going to be tough. Interest rates are going to come down a little bit, but a little bit. You know, they're not coming down to anything like what they were. When we talk about property prices, um, people talk about averages and we talk about micro markets, different places. Sure. But there's also property types. And I know you do yes. a lot of new developments. Yes. And new developments are often more, um, uh, they're more sensitive to prices, price falls at these sort of times. How have you found that market from a seller's point of view? Well, what we find is with the new build, um, the, the, it's like building a new, buying a new car. Mm -hmm. you know, if, you build, if you buy at the start of a development... People say, oh, well, buy, buy at the start of development because um, the market will just increase as the development goes through, the estate goes, gets built. But, act, but that's fine in an inflationary market. But when it's not an inflationary market, these house builders will start discounting like hell once mm -hmm. you've bought, if you're not careful. Yes. And yes, if you yes. try and sell a second-hand house when they're still selling new ones you've got no chance because they've got all the incentives they can give you the stamp duty and everything else probably they might be paying for people to the solicitor's fees and so on you're in trouble if you buy a new house at the moment to live in live in it <laughs> don't try and sell it in six months time because you'll probably take a loss so john i know you're completing some new build developments uh, up and down the country um are you worried about the sale prices of those in, in the current market? No, I couldn't care less. And Go the on. reason I couldn't care less is because we're, we're, we bought at the right price. Yes. We bought the site at the right price. And at the end of the day, you know, if they go for 10000 less than we think, well, so be it. I don't think they will because we've been pretty hard on the prices in the first place. And, of course, selling is always in the buying. Is all, sorry, selling is always in the buying. So mm -hmm, if you buy mm -hmm. right, you can always sell right. Absolutely, absolutely. Do you feel they'll take longer to sell? Because uh, it's all linked to mortgage affordability as well. And we know that you know, anyone looking to raise a 300 grand mortgage to buy a property um, has to have far more salary and uh, affordability yeah. uh, criteria than they did uh, two years ago when interest rates were a lot lower. Uh, and that obviously affects the pool of buyers available for your property today. I uh, certainly last year that was the case. I think this year it started off with a little bit but more optimism mm -hmm. amongst people. Um, and uh, it's very early days, obviously. But, but it seems to me that things this year uh, uh, will be better than last year. I mean, last year, the mo most of the major house builders and most estate agencies, including ours, our group, we were down 30% on turnover. Mm -hmm. And most of the house builders mirrored that. They were mm -hmm. down 30%. They were building, sorry, selling 30% less houses than the year before. This year, I think they'll be 15% down from where they were two years ago. So they'll be 15% better off than they were last year, but still 15% worse off than they were two years ago. Interest rates. I mean, they've been going up. We've had 15 consecutive rate rises and all the rest of it. We've peaked now. People are talking about them going back down again. Um, where do you think we'll be at the end of the year? 
Well, I don't think there'll be less than 4% base rate. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you're borrowing money to develop properties like we are, it's not going to make a lot of difference. You know, um, most of these banks now, if you're borrowing, uh, are 11 12%. 11 12 percent investment i've got some in, i've got you know some in, um, in investment properties where i'm you know i've i've fixed for 50 years at 4.1 percent two years ago but i've also got some stuff that is at six percent i've got mm-hmm. commercial that's at 5.1 percent fixed so is you know it's all five to six percent seems to be the benchmark for investment investment loans but all the um uh, uh, interest rates have peaked; they're coming down a little bit. But still, for all the people coming off fixed-rate mortgages, um, it's still going to be a massive increase for them to um, opt into an, another loan product when they come off those fixed-rate mortgages. That's going to affect the property market a little bit, isn't it? That's why I think it won't go up. Hmm. So there's 2.3 million people this year coming off fixed fixed-rate mortgages, be it house mortgages. Or, or, of course, investment mortgages. People forget about the buy-to-let. Yes, yes. That's a major, major uh, challenge because they're going perhaps from 2% to 6 7%, whereas some of, the, some of the, 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 the house owners are probably maybe going from 2 to 5 or 1.5 to 5. Mm-hmm. It's a massive jump, massive jump. And people don't get it. You know, People who aren't in that situation don't understand it. And do you know that 50% of properties in this country do not have a mortgage on them? 50%. That's a lot, isn't it? It's amazing, isn't it? That's a lot. I mean, th- th- that's for the own-occupier market yeah. Yeah. rather than the... Bu- I mean, yes. I think the buy-to-let market, mortgage market, and the own-occupier, it's on mm. two different twin totally, tracks. Totally, And I think one of the key differences now that's emerging is, of course, the arrangement fees on buy-to-let mortgages. Yeah. Where it's, uh, I mean, when I got my first buy-to-let mortgage, it was a £100 arrangement fee. Now they're talking about 7% of the loan. It wasn't even called a buy-to-let mortgage <laughs> in those days, was it, Ranjan? <laughs> just called a, it just, it just called investment, investment well, something loan. like that, yeah. I mean, but when they were... When buy-to-let inter- mortgages were yeah. introduced, yeah. I mean, the lo- arrangement fee was literally just yeah. um, for doing basic admin. Yeah. It wasn't 7% of the loan. Yeah. Uh, but that changes the economics of things, doesn't totally, it? Totally, because you have to add that 7% on, onto it. You say, oh, I've got a great rate, and, and no one tells, tells you that, yeah, but I've had to pay 7% to, to, to get it. I mean, it's a joke, isn't it? it, it you know, you have a pain of money up front, or you're, or you're getting a slightly less interest rate, but you can't have both, basically, can you? We talked about um, residential prices um, and flatlining, and I agree with you on that. Um, what do you think about commercial property values? Because I know you do a bit of commercial property yes. as well. And, of course, commercial property works in a different way to residential property, and it's far more um, linked to interest rates and what they are. Um, so what's your view on commercial property values during the course of this year? Well, I... For commercial buy to let, yes, is. I tend, yeah, I so I I deal in the what I call the secondary shop market, really. Mm-hmm. Although in more recent years, I've managed to buy one or two prime, which uh, you know, you and I could never buy prime ten years ago. We would dream of buying mm-hmm. a boot store, wouldn't we, or something like that? It would just because all the pension schemes, pension That's true. companies bought them. They uh, they own them and they didn't they sell them. them, and they wouldn't sell them, and they'd buy them at a four or five percent yield. Mm. Now we're able to buy a lot of vacant stock. Most of the stock I've been buying across the UK has been at about £50 a foot, freehold. Mm-hmm. £50 a foot, freehold. Not London, of course. You specialise in London more. I, I, I don't. So the opportunities have been vast for commercial property. And I think that will continue for a while. I don't see it going down anymore because I don't think it can go down anymore. When you say the opportunities for commercial property, do you mean commercial property buy to let? Commercial property repurposing to alternative commercial yeah. uses or commercial to resi, all three in different ways. I, I, I really mean all three in different ways. If you're converting any p- property uh, which only has a, a value at the end of it of around £300 a foot, you can't afford to pay more than £50 a foot for it. To be quite blunt, maybe 60 70 maybe, mm-hmm. because you won't make any money because the, the cost of construction has gone up so much. It, it really has. And on the commercial side, commercial shop side, you know, we love buying vacant shops. Yes. Because we know now that if you ask half the rent that the, the, the original tenant was paying, mm-hmm. it's about right. So all the high streets, all the rents have halved. And if it's halved, people will have a go. They will rent a shop in the high street or off the or secondary, secondary streets if they can make a go of it. 
and they can make a go if the rents were about half what they were. That's true. I, I, I've tended to find, from my experience in this sector, is that if you've got strong footfall yep. uh, and the rents are right, people will have a go for retail yes. or some service-orientated yes. yes. business. If it's secondary and there isn't the footfall, um, people choose it as an alternative to a serviced office. Yes, um, they're not because, interested they're, in because the they've got a shop front. Exactly, you know, and the shop front is worth something to them—not a lot, probably, but something. Yes, yes, yes. Now, we can't really do a predictions episode of this podcast without tackling the fact that this is election year uh, in the UK. And John, you are have been involved in the Conservative Party a long time. You're chairman of the. Um, it, uh, I was chairman of Ipswich, Ipswich Association. Now, now they may be president. They've booted me upstairs. President even of the uh, Ipswich yes. Conservative yes. Association. One question I've always wanted to ask yeah. you is. Um, why didn't you ever decide to be an MP rather than just be involved behind the scenes? <laughs> well, if or I you told, didn't like the expenses. It, well, <laughs> if I yeah, thank you for that. If I told you that I did apply at one point and and I didn't I didn't I didn't um, you have to go on a list mm -hmm. um, um, and to go on the list you have to do lots of tests and lots of this that and the other and I failed. <laughs> and interestingly, a lot of people think that the only people that get on the list these days are very young. Um, young aspirational politicians that are, cou are councillors and people um, who are, who are um, PPE at Oxford, PPE <laughs> Oxford, and also pe people who um, make it into a, a, a lifelong career from day one, from twenty years old. And of course, in the old days, that mm. wasn't the case. If you're relatively successful in the business you know, you would probably become a, an MP because you've got lots of life experience. Mm. Most, most politicians these days are career politicians. And that is really what's, well, certainly partly wrong with the system at the moment. So what view. motivates you to um, take up that role and be involved okay. at that local level? Well, it, what, what motivated <clears throat> me was because I wanted to return a, a, um, a Conservative MP, to, MP for Ipswich, which is very difficult because an Ipswich is, is a... Is a bit of a hung seat, you know, mm -hmm. it, it sways from one to the other, but predominantly Labour, it's a Labour council. And um, yeah, I passionately believe uh, Ipswich in an area where I obviously invest quite a lot of money. Um, I've been a Conservative donor for a number of years. So, you know, it, a, a, and actually the membership's about £30. Mm. Better membership than any gym you can have because the contacts you make... Keeps you fit. Keeps you fit. Walk in the streets, knocking on doors. But also the people you meet, the contacts... The dinners you have, you know, with, with top politicians. And That's what people. I wanted to kind of ask yeah. you about, because I know you've met um, most of the, pretty yes. much all the people yeah. in the cabinet and yes. the people that run the country at the moment. Yes. Um, and um, I say this as, a, as a, 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 a natural conservative who's been very disillusioned. You know, I grew up under Margaret Thatcher, thought she was wonderful, fully understood what she was getting at. This lot seemed to have moved more left. Yes. And, you know, I don't see much difference between this lot and what Ed Middleband was standing for mm. um, several years ago. Um, what do you say to people like me who feel disillusioned, but they feel their natural home is Conservatives, mm. but they just feel disillusioned by what they're offering for I business think, and yeah. property and I, everything? I, I mean, I, I feel in many ways the same way as you do, and many people of our age group do. And I would say that just cast your mind back to a Labour government because we can, we actually can. Of course, if you're under 35, you've never ever seen, or under 33, really seen or a Labour government. But you know, you say that, but high you know, taxes. The 70s was bad, yes. yes. But Tony Blair's era. I would argue, was fantastic for entrepreneurs. I mean, he brought in entrepreneurs' relief, he did. Um, the 10%. 10%. Yeah. Uh, he brought in the fact that directors of companies can contribute um, 200 and something thousand pounds a year to their pension. It was the Conservatives that subsequently brought it down, down, down. And entrepreneurial stuff was rising under Tony Blair. It was, but I think Tony Blair was a Conservative in, in Labour clothing, wasn't he? That's true. Uh, a good private school boy. Uh, what I would say is that under most or all Labour governments, just about uh, tax goes up. Mm -hmm. And we're paying a lot of tax in this country already. And the trick is, as soon as they get in, they say, oh, it's a lot worse than we thought. The ones who can afford are going to have to pay more tax. Okay. 
if you take the view that, that there's not much difference between the Conservative and Labour, they're all pretty lefty, quite frankly, why should us as property people be worried or f- why should we fear a Labour government? Or that's should a, we? That's a great question. In terms of mm. inflation, uh, a bit of inflation has never done any property developer or investor any harm. So under Labour, you get more inflation. Normally, they spend more if that's possible. I mean, we've had COVID. So, I mean, to mm. be fair to the Conservative government, they haven't done a great job, in my view, on certain things, but they've had a hell of a run. You know, you've had COVID, Brexit, whichever you think of Brexit. I was a big Brexit supporter. Um, it hasn't been hasn't been rolled out as as it should have been, in my view. Maybe perhaps because of COVID, we were perhaps too generous over COVID. You know, this people in this country now uh, think whatever's wrong with the country, it's the it, 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 it you know it's the government's fault. They don't stand up and think, oh, it might be my fault. You know, I'm overweight. Why is that? Oh well. You know, too much cheap food. Well, you eat it. You know, so you've got to be responsibility, uh, have some responsibility for yourself. For things like buy to let, for example, um, you know, the, the with the um, renters reform bill that the Conservatives have brought in, mm. you know, I mean, how much more in favour of the tenant? Is legislation likely to go? Well, I, mean, it's, well, I it's think it's gone I think pretty far enough. I, isn't I'm it? glad you teed me up on that one. Go on because, then, <laughs> because you know, under Labour, if you think Michael oh. Gove has been a bit of a dick, to be quite honest with you, uh, for the landlords, and he has been, mm. by the way, uh, mainly because the buy-to-let market has taken out all the first potential first-time buyers. Because if you can sell a property to a buy-to-let investor or a first-time buyer, you're always going to sell it to a buy-to-let because it'll be easier. So what they've tried to do is change that round, change that and, and bring in large investors from America on these big funds that want to build four or five hundred flats at a time and rent them out and do away with the small private landlord. The fact is they can't afford to do it, get away with the small landlord because because it, what is it four, five, six million people they uh, accommodate. So it, it's a problem. But under that Labour... That sounds very stupid logic. It is stupid logic, um, but that's what they're... Build that's, more. Well, build more, but of course that's been a major, major problem. Over the next 10 years, we need to build 1.6 million more houses above the 300,000 they're meant to be building. The truth is they need to build 500,000, 600,000 houses a year. It's never going to happen under Labour. They will build more social houses. And by the way, if uh, you know, with the, so- with the social housing requirement when you do a development, it's, it's now um, 30% over 10 units, basically. That's going to probably go to 50% over, over five units, I should think, or something damn silly. So that, that, you know, this is a Labour government. They are socialists. They mm-hmm. don't believe in anyone owning more than one house. Are you worried by some of these musings um, by some Labour people about um, if you have planning permission on a field somewhere to build something, but you don't implement it in a certain time frame, they're going to take it off you or charge yeah. you this, that and the yeah. other? Yeah, compulsory purchase it. Um, well, interestingly, uh, I, I think they'll try. There'll be a lot of challenges. But one thing they are thinking of doing, of course, is Milton Keynes was built uh, on land that was purchased at farm value. Mm-hmm. You know, land value, agricultural value. That's why it got built. And what they're talking about is CPOing large swathes of land to build new homes on. And if they do that, that'll be very interesting. And that's a very radical, very brave thing to do. And I thought, of course, something that the Tories could not do. They mm-hmm. could, no way could they get away with that as a, as a Tory party, but the Labour, but Labour can. So it, it'll be very interesting. One quick thing I would say also is that under the Reform Act, uh, at the moment, going through the Renters Reform Act, you're, you, you know, you as a landlord, you'll be able to get vacant possession on your home if you want to sell it. Probably, we don't know yet. There's been a hundred pages of amendments to the white paper, so lots, lots going on. However, under Labour, you know exactly what's going to happen. They'll say that tenant can stay there as long as you like, which makes w- so they become what's called sitting tenants. Mm-hmm. They'll be paying market rent. It'll be in a, what's called a sure tenancy. They'll be there for life. Now, good luck when you go to your bank and they say, what's your property worth? You say, oh, it's worth £200,000 vacant. And you go, and they go, well, it's not vacant. So we're not 50000 off that. Do you think the banks will um, lobby against that? Because obviously they have got some £300 billion invested in loans in the buy-to-let marketplace. And if it affects their security, they're stuffed. 
well, it will affect their security and they will be stuffed and there will be lots and lots of landlords that can't get vacant possession, so have to sell probably, you know, in the old days, and you've, you've taken advantage of this and mm-hmm. I have, where we bought blocks of flats in the old days because you couldn't, people couldn't get the tenants out, so we pay you know, up to 50% discount on open market value. And then we wait and they slowly come vacant and we sell them off individually. So, you know, I, I wish I was... 20 years, 30 years younger, because it takes probably five years for people to twig that this is a problem. And I've had people talk to me and say, oh, it's not a problem. I want to keep my tenant in anyway. Well, good luck with that, because uh, you aren't wanting to keep them in until you want to sell it, and then you want them out, and you won't be able to get them out. So given that labour is highly likely to come in, what do you think business people and property entrepreneurs um, should be most fearful of? Two Um, two things. Only two. (laughs) <laughs> well, two major things. One, v- getting vacant possession property mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. because I don't think you'll be able to. And the other thing, if you're a developer, I think you won't be t- paying. You won't be. It won't be thirty percent social housing over ten units. It will be fifty, and that will wow. kill, kill the housing market more than anything else because we need to build new homes. In an election year, of course, um, there's a lot of. Um, um, I don't know, it it just throws a little bit of a spanner in the works in that a lot of people don't want to do anything. I'm not really talking about business people or entrepreneurs. Mm. I'm talking about homeowners. It's the biggest decision of their life and they don't want to move until the election's sorted and and that kind of stuff. So what opportunities do you see for property entrepreneurs to benefit from the fact that a lot of the market is just having this wait-and-see approach? Well, you're absolutely right. Every general election, when it comes round... Um, a lot of negativity, a lot of cautiousness, which actually is, is a load of rubbish, isn't it? Because, you know, I hate to use the average person because no one's average in this country, mm-hmm. in my view. But people, people living in a, you know, in, is, in their own home, you know, it's not going to make a massive difference to them who's in government for the first year or two. And, it, and uh, what I find, and what we find in the estate agents, we, you know, that we own, is that if there's a, if there's a two partners. Mr. and Mrs. or partners, I'm very trendy using that word now, aren't I, Ranjan, partners, uh, of, of whatever. Um, one of them's positive, one of them's negative. And, and it, it's a great excuse for the negative person to say, oh, let's just wait and see what happens, because they don't really want to move anyway. Mm-hmm, That's mm-hmm. what I find. And uh, it is a problem. It is a real problem. And, of course, once, if and when Labour do get in, what's the market going to do? Is, you know, what's the pound going to do? Yes, against yes. the dollar and all this. So there's a lot of setting in period, you know, once a new government's in. And of course, this lot have got no experience, ministerial experience whatsoever. They know where number 10 down yes. the street is just about, and they know num- where number 11 is, but they've never been there. You know, that reminds me, it's, uh, just to revisit one of my earlier questions on interest rates, because a lot of people are saying, you know, this is where interest rates will be at the end of the year. Um, But they're almost answering that question, ignoring the fact that there's an election in between. Mm -hmm. They're just extrapolating trends on inflation and all of that. But if the markets don't have faith in the policies of the first 100 days of a Labour government, then that will force the Bank of England to act and raise. Mm -hmm. And the question is, when people are seeing fixed rates and mortgage rates come down now, is it a golden opportunity to fix those to fix into deals now before an election or chance afterwards? What you would you do? Have, you have thrown me the biggest spanner. <laughs> uh, so difficult because if we say on here, yeah, fix, fix, fix now, they go, well, that, that Ranjan and Johnny were. Uh, oh, this ma- is not financial blame, advice, by the way. By the way. It's not, it's not financial, <laughs> by the way, they won't blame you, they'll blame me because you've asked me the damn question. Uh, it's so, so difficult. But, but what you, you've made a very, very good point there in as much that the, the markets need confidence in the Labour government. The way the Labour government uh, or, the, or the shadow government now are talking is very sensible, very calm. Um, they're not looking to do anything radical early on apart from get rid of school fees, uh, inheritance tax changes probably, which isn't going to affect the market. <coughs> Uh, I think they'll be fairly cautious. I think Starmer's a very cautious man, very cautious man. Um, And I think the first 100 days, 
the temptation would be to change everything but i mm-hmm. in my experience it takes time to change things they might change the odd thing and make a point but i think overall um it will be fairly steady um so i don't think it will make a huge difference to interest rates but of course the bank of england are independent uh, and um the governor of the bank of england hasn't exactly covered himself in glory he's got inflation wrong he's got predictions wrong so uh, you know who knows when i asked you about the biggest fears of an incoming labor mm. government you didn't mention anything um about tax on mm. property developers buy to let landlords mm. or anyone doing any kind of property well business. i didn't because i thought that was pretty obvious ranjan <laughs> uh, tax under labor government will go up i i mean i can see the high net worth earners uh, paying uh, 60% tax eventually i think they'll say as soon as they're in they'll say oh we didn't know it was this bad the ones who earn the money will have to pay that's what i think will happen wow that's uh well i hope that doesn't happen so do i but um you know a lot of people are highly mobile these days do you think that can work i i think ab- absolutely and i i think they've got to be very careful because like you said if you've got an internet company uh you can be you can be sitting on a beach in dubai doing your work can't you absolutely so um in a uh, what's your view i mean i know you do a lot of you do a lot of everything really but um in a market where things are a little bit uncertain mm. is there an argument for saying um okay instead of doing a new build project mm. where by it can take 3 4 years yeah. before you are at a point where you can sell is it better to switch to permitted development type of projects where the fabric of the building is already there and you can be in and out in a shorter horizon mm. and it's more predictable what the market will be at that end point because it's maybe only a year away that Do old you have a view on that that old chestnut yeah that old chestnut yeah. pd or ground up um well they're very very different mm. so i see pd as a stepping stone between investment and property development mm-hmm. because it is it is simpler it's not it's not simple but it is simpler and yes it can take less time if you get it right and of course if you if it takes less time you can afford to um accept less profit because if you can turn your money twice in the same time as you can do a longer development then the longer development leads to be much more profitable in the first place so um in a market that's that that that, that is unpredictable and uh challenging speed is the speed of the essence mm-hmm. but that is of course unless you look and say well we've had a bit of a tough time where are we going to be in 2 years time so we're now we haven't done any conversions really uh for 2 or 3 years mm-hmm. because i didn't want to be finishing conversions in the middle of a of a property recession or whatever you want to call mm-hmm. it but i'm putting my head above the parapet now and i'm thinking and i've got a couple of deals we've just agreed care homes to convert into 20 odd flats and so on and i'm thinking where am i going to be in 2 years time we're not going to be in this situation interest rate can be lower uh the market will probably be having improved and by the way the market might improve very quickly this year of course if they bring back help to buy mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which they might do if the election is going to be in november which i think it will be in november they might bring that back in march and get six good mums uh, make everyone feel better before the election okay so a lot happening of course now if you were to give your two pennies worth advice to someone um looking to uh make a profit in 2024 what sort of strategies what sort of opportunities should they be looking at well if they want to make a profit within within a year less than a year in property you've got to go some no i mean what should they be doing i mean what what opportunities should they be looking at what would be your red hot tip for someone uh investing in property in 2024 i think there's lots of ways of making money out of property whatever you choose you have to have a passion for that and you have to enjoy what you mm-hmm. do i enjoy every aspect of of property just about it drain clearance Dr- it, well <laughs> i get someone else to do it to be honest with you <laughs> property management funny enough i get someone else to do that as well so it really just depend i i love trading so mm-hmm. my big passion is is trading buying and selling if i didn't have to build anything or convert anything ever again it wouldn't bother me if i could trade 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 and i think if you can buy at the right money you can always sell and auctions i think are a great way to start that process and 
over the next nine months, year, I'll be looking at auctions. As a, wait, wait, as a place to buy? Sure, absolutely. A place to buy. And I'll be looking not to be doing an, an extensive renovation, if I could avoid it, but something I can get in and out of relatively quickly. What are you seeing in auctions? I mean, I, I, I know that, say, if you compare most auction catalogues to pre-COVID, there's, there's two times or three times the number of lots in there. Yeah, absolutely. So the number of properties going to auction is huge. Yes. And I suspect that the homes under the hammer buyer... <laughs> Is uh, and you know the number of mums with prams in yes. the aisles uh, a little bit less yes. um, now. Uh, so, what exactly are the opportunities in auction? Well, I've been seeing? buying. I've been buying an auction for thirty-five years, and of course, we owned Auction House UK, the biggest auction house in the UK on lots sold, not not the amount of money raised, but on lots sold. And um, the auction market is a great barometer for the property market. So, whatever happens in auctions happens everywhere else later, mm. six nine months a year mm-hmm. later. So what we're finding in auctions at the moment is that the very simple stuff, the, the, the simple stuff um, under 150000 is popular, very popular. As you go up in terms of value, there's less buyers, of course, and the more sophisticated deals, there's even less. And once you get over a million, there aren't many buyers around. Mm-hmm. So depending what money you've got to spend, and I always say the same thing, when people come to me and moan, can't find a deal i said well there's four and a half thousand properties in an auction in auction every month Mm -hmm. are you telling me you can't find a deal out of that lot because if you are you're a liar go find an opportunity there's opportunities in every auction you just need to pick the right one what are your um go-to opportunities what sort of strategies i mean there are lots of things you can do simple um, pick up freehold houses that are shabby and tart them up a little bit, title splitting opportunities, there are all sorts of things that you can do, short leases and stuff like that, or problems with paperwork that you just um, sort of resolve and spin them back on the market. W- what sort of strategies are you, d- do you find um, most profitable and easy to do? The most profitable are the most difficult. Always the most difficult. So we're doing a number, we've got a number of projects on the go at the moment where, where we've bought off receivers where you don't know what the hell's gone on half the time mm-hmm. in the past with the, with the development. And they are, okay, you can argue they're slightly more risky, but of course with risk comes um, potential larger profits. And we're interested in making you know decent money out of every deal. We don't make decent money out of every deal, by the way. And I think if you're 70% successful, uh, that's a pretty good. That's a pretty good uh, uh, target. You know, don't beat yourself up if you get it wrong. We all get it wrong. We've all made mistakes. You ran, even you, Ranjan, have made a mistake or two in property. The key is to learn from that mistake and try not to make it again. You probably will make it again mm-hmm. in a different way, but don't beat yourself up. Don't lose confidence and buy what you enjoy doing. So if you enjoy doing terrace houses, up great. If you enjoy buying lock-up garages, buy lock-up garages. You know, you can make good money out of lock-up garages. You know, it, it, whatever you have a passion for, you should do. And don't let, l- don't let the property educators push you down one route because they think or you think that's the only route there is in property. There's lots of different routes and it's up to you to decide what you want to do. And in an auction catalogue, there's everything. There's absolutely there's everything. everything. It's a great place to start but you've got to have some balls. Do you think um, 2024 um, is going to be an average year, best year ever uh, for you or what? Where do you think it's going to rank? Well, we always say that um, we make money every other year. Every other year? Every other year, because it takes two years at least to get your money out of a deal. So last year we invested a lot of money, relatively. This year I hope to get some of it back. Uh, and go again Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's what it's about and even if you make a mistake and you can only get your money back or less than your money back you paid for it get out of it the reason you get out of it because you've got your dealing money to invest in another deal you won't make the same mistake again the market might be a lot less than it was then because it might have been two or three years ago when you bought you've Mm -hmm. had problems with cost of materials and builders and so on we've all had those problems Mm. But uh, what I do find is people are looking for the perfect deal. The perfect deal does not exist. Every deal has a challenge that you have to overcome. Yes. We are really problem solvers, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. aren't we? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and I think people have, have got 
want everything to be perfect. It's mm-hmm. not going to be perfect. But you just got to get out, get out there, get stuck in, find a deal, get it done, drive it forward. You are the captain of the ship. No one else is going to drive it forward if you don't and get it sold. It is imperfect property deals that we're looking at because totally. we, we're making them. Per- I mean, the job yeah. over, you can't buy off a developer because in my view, they have already developed that property yep. to the maximum value per square foot. So what's what's in there They've for you to do? They've profit out of it. Exactly. That's the whole point of a yeah, developer. Absolutely. So we want something that's imperfect yeah. that we can take to the maximum per square foot. Yes. Um, that's our job, isn't it? Totally, that's our job. And and that's what we all, we all try and do. I mean, we're realistic on prices because we want to get things sold quickly. You know... <laughs> I get people that contact me and say, oh, I can't sell it. I'm not letting it go for a penny less and so on. I go, well, more for you. Because if you sell it for 20, 25,000 less, you get your money out, you go again. What's wrong with that? Oh, well, it's a principle. Well, if you've got principles, don't be in property. Because to be honest with you, principles or being too proud, you know what happens after pride comes a fall. So uh, we'll be filming our seventh uh, series. I of cannot believe property elevator. we have done seven series together and not seriously fell out. Uh, n- no punches. No punches. Um, We've disagreed I, I, a few I've, times on air. And I'm, I have been physically un- unharmed to date. <laughs> <laughs> so far. <laughs> so far, yes. And, and the producers always want me to be the bad guy. This is what I get. That's what I, I said. Well, I you can be Mr. Y- Nasty. You don't, you don't have to do much acting. <laughs> <laughs> so that's probably why. But no, what I wanted to ask you on, on the sort of prediction segment, yeah. if you like, is then, you know, uh, we've pretty much been in the show since the beginning. We have, yeah. And the character of the deals that get funded changes from season yes. to season depending yes. on the property market yes. and what's going on so what are your predictions for the types of deals that you think w- the angels are going to salivate over and want to back this season as opposed to previous seasons where they may have funded something but this season if they present that deal no one's going to be interested well what i would say is the beauty of the show there's two great things about the mm. show um and then there's the fact that you're in it. Oh, of course. So, <laughs> so there's three. So, uh, so what I would say about the show is you've got five experts, all who have made money, all in different ways. Mm-hmm. So if you bring a deal, um, I may hate it. I, may, I wouldn't touch that with a barge pole. You may not like it. Mm-hmm. Haley may not like it. Nicholas Warwick might think it's wonderful. Mm-hmm. So everyone's got a different angle. Everyone's confident uh, in a way with what they do on a daily day, a, a day-to-day basis. And if it fits that, mm-hmm. they're, they're going to be all over it. Paul Mahoney's super bright guy. He's brighter than you, Ranjan. <laughs> and uh, certainly brighter than me. You know, he sees things that, because he's an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. and that's the mix. We've got entrepreneurs, we've got in property investors, we've got, you know, at the HMO Queen, Hayley Andrews, you know, serviced accommodation. Um, she used to be a princess, now I call her the queen. Uh, we've got Promotion. Nicholas Warwick who, who does all sorts of interesting he always seems to catch you and me out if you don't mind yeah, he does, saying he? <laughs> because he said we go oh that's a load of rubbish we don't want to do that we're out we're out we're out and he goes I'm not and then he turns the deal around Jesus I didn't think of that mm-hmm. I'll get really cross with myself uh, that I haven't thought of it so two things people must realise about the show is one is that it's very it's an educational show. So all the time, you know, the people that come on the show are genuine. They've got a genuine deal. They want to do it. Now, even if an angel says yes, we will do it, or two or three of us might say yes, we argue about who's going to do it. Sometimes or a lot of the time, they don't get done, mm-hmm. and that's because the mar- uh, the deal changes. It's not quite what we think, or someone else has gone and outbid them, but. The fact that they've made contact with us, they have our details, and we like them, obviously we wouldn't have said we'd invest with them, means that they can always contact us again with another deal. And Nicholas mm. has done a number of deals outside the framework of the property elevator. In fact, we should all get some commission out of him. So when we start filming you know, next month, we will get a, a, all sorts of different deals. And we want that. We want that variety of people and the variety of deals because... There's something there for everyone then. If all the deals are the same, it, it doesn't work. The fact that the deals are different and quirky, some people are quirky, some people aren't, some people are very serious, some people are very nervous. You know, we're not there to make fools of anyone. Mm-hmm. We're there to support and help. And if nothing else, if you don't get your deal funded, 
you've still made some great contacts. Absolutely, absolutely. So much happens on that show. And I think it's all about leverage. It's about leveraging. Uh, it's about us as angels leveraging our contacts and our experience to often make a deal worthwhile, yes. which the entrepreneur who's yeah. pitching could not do so on their own. I always that happens time and time again. Time again. again. I, always, I always say, let's make the deal deal fit. Let's make it work by changing it, tweaking it, changing it. Uh, and, and you're right. Uh, setting a deal up correctly is so important. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think inexperience, which is understandable. We don't expect everyone to be experienced when they come on. It can be mm -hmm. their first deal, can't it? Um, but they need to listen. Mm -hmm. And if they're not prepared to listen, um, and if they're difficult to work with, even if it's a good deal, I don't want to do it. Okay. On that note, when John's telling me, um, mentioning difficult to work with, I think it's a good time <laughs> to uh, wrap up this episode. <laughs> so uh, leave your comments. Tell us what you think about this in, uh, in the comments below. John, you've been fabulous. Thanks for joining it's me. It's a pleasure. And see you guys next time.